Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the University of Melbourne for Science Week. We're starting Science Week a little bit early, um, as traditionally it has begun next week. But we've had so many um, activities already. And as you can see in the chat, the University of Melbourne Science Faculty has over 20 different um, <clears throat> public lectures and seminars and panels to um, access next week. So I welcome you to the start of Science Week for the University of Melbourne. My name's Anne-Marie Tozzolini. I'm a paleobotanist, which means I specialise in fossil plants. And you can see a couple, um, uh, one of the ones behind me. Um, so I'm from the brand new School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences that has uh, just become up and running this year it's emerged from the old um, earth and geography schools at the university of melbourne so today i'm going to take you on a journey back to the cretaceous and we're going to delve into understanding the polar life um, if we have a look at this picture of antarctica and the south pole we think of it today as being very cold dry inhospitable kind of environment this hasn't always been the case and when we journey back into the Cretaceous we're going to see were there thick ice caps across the poles, what were the continents like and of course uh, having a look at using the fossils to understand what the life was like. When was the Cretaceous? Well, it was from 66 to 150 million years ago. I'm sure you've heard of Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, and you can see that uh, the modern era, uh, extending right back through majority of Earth's history of the Phanerozoic, um, from when we start to recognize modern animals, um, includes the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. So we're sitting up here at zero today, we go back past the humans and other hominids. The genus Homo has been around about 2 million years and we go back past the mammoths, past all the other very um, strange large mammals and we go back into the Cretaceous. It's the last period after the Triassic and Jurassic within the Mesozoic. And so it is an exciting time. It was very, very different from today. And we're going to have a look at some of the uh, fossils from here in Victoria. So our focus today is on the Southeast Australian part of the, um, of a, of the ancient supercontinent. So let's have a look. What was the world like? What were the continents configured like? What do the rocks themselves tell us? There are layers in the rocks, in the sedimentary rocks, and we can peel them back like pages in a book and read the history and see if we can help us to understand our world around us and the environment. What were the um, uh, poles like? Were there even glaciers? And what were the fossils like? So if we have a look at this amazing um, paleogeography reconstruction from the 600 or 550 million years ago. The Cambrian period is when we see modern life starting to evolve. The ones that we recognize, um, and this is by um, Christopher Scatiz from University in Illinois. And you can see as we work through time, we can pause it here about 150 million years ago is the beginning of the Cretaceous. You can see these ancient supercontinent known as Gondwana has broken off from Pangaea, the, the biggest supercontinent of all time. And you can see that as we move through time, India will break away, Africa breaks away. We're left with land bridges between South America and Antarctica and Australia still attached right down near the South Pole. So Antarctica has been over the South Pole for over 100,000, 100 million years. And you can see Australia on its journey north to the world that we recognize today with the ice caps. So back in the Cretaceous, we'll be looking at the earliest part. So it is divided into two main parts. Um, we'll be having a look at how those tectonic plates were joined in Gondwana. But as Australia began to break up that away from Antarctica, this actually formed a large rift valley with uh, the Gippsland and Otway areas forming large sedimentary basins, big catchment areas, and so huge rivers, uh, as we'll see. And so we're looking at that 
first half of the Cretaceous about 100 to 130 million years. And we're going to divide it into three different time slices as we look at how the fossils and the rocks themselves can tell us so much about that world and that environment. So we uh, have done at the University of Melbourne, and our research group have done uh, field work to over 50 different sites, collected way over 150 uh, different samples to analyse. And so we have collaborated as well with um, scientists from the museum and Monash and Swinburne. And so this is really a joint um, a project, um, just summarising a lot of our different research papers that have been uh, brought together. But this is just to give you an idea of what would have happened as Australia broke away from Antarctica. You can see that the uh, mantle has uh, convection due to uh, the heat rising, convecting, and it starts to push the land apart and actually split and rift this large <clears throat> valley forms. And initially, we see a uh, very, very narrow kind of valley. You can see volcanoes. And so these volcanoes would have um, formed over towards New Zealand, way to the east of Victoria. Um, but the rivers would have brought all this volcanic material down into um, the Otway and Gippsland areas. And so then we start to see um, the Rift Valley fill up with uh, first lakes, and then eventually the ocean. So the ocean wasn't thought to come in until that second half of the Cretaceous. Um, <clears throat> but we've been looking in detail at not just uh, collecting rocks, but really describing these rocks, drawing the uh, different layers. And so we can build up an understanding of how the different environments influence these, um, these products. Not only are they very thick sandstones, but these beautiful organic rich mudstones, which host a lot of the uh, different plant fossil material, uh, as well as very microscopic kinds of uh, fossils as well that I'll introduce you to. So here is where all of these uh, uh, fossil rich um, Cretaceous, early Cretaceous age rocks exist, but the ones that come out at the surface um, actually have were down in a big basin have been pushed up to form our mountain ranges as the Otways and Strislecki ranges. So uh, also along the coastal areas and Inverloch is a famous site as well as over here in Dinosaur Cove for uh, some of the dinosaur fossils, but the plant fossils can be found all over. So I've used the rocks themselves to uh, help us understand how this rift valley formed, where the rivers were coming from the east, bringing in volcanic material. And so they were these very large uh, <clears throat> river systems, huge channels that were intertwining called braided rivers, feeding off the nearby hills and um, and some lakes were able to also form. But there is no evidence of glaciers and certainly no ice caps at this time um, over this region, which would have sat within the Antarctic Circle, uh, but was not um, over the South Pole necessarily. So we would have to look to Antarctica to see if we could find more evidence um, of the any, any glaciers. And interestingly, there are glacial deposits of large rocks being called dropstones um, up in Queensland at this time. So that brings us to the plant fossils. What have we discovered? We've found the plants that don't make seeds versus the plants that make seeds known as uh, the gymnosperms, such as conifers and seed ferns. And as for the flowering plants, Charles Darwin himself called it an abominable mystery as to how the flowering plants were non-existent through the Jurassic. They were not to be known from the early Cretaceous and suddenly they appeared in the late Cretaceous in uh, Europe. And so where did they come from? How did they evolve and how did they spread so rapidly? So amazing uh, some of the <clears throat> finds that have occurred here in our own backyard. We have found these uh, understory uh, made up of these beautiful diverse range of ferns and other really wet loving lush forest uh, liverworts and some of the ferns are still around today um, related to the, the blechnum ferns and the glycaenial ferns that we find in New Zealand and Tasmania and even in Victorian forests um, in the Otways and Gippsland as well. And um, we also find evidence of tree ferns that go right back to this time, 100, over 100 million years. 
in the mid story, we're finding these strange ancient lineages that are related to the modern um, cycads, but they were extremely diverse. Known that they were seed forming, um, they had these fern-like foliage, so they're called seed ferns, but they were uh, often forming these trunks as well. Uh, we have ginkgo, so the modern ginkgo biloba is a relic, it is a living fossil. It has it is known as the Chinese maiden hair fern and it's been found only from China. But incredibly, we've got fossils covering um, uh, Australia and Queensland and Victoria and into Antarctica at this time in the early Cretaceous. Um, instead of being bilobed with just two lobes on the leaves, you can see that they're very dissected into these palm shaped leaves. And we've got the conifers forming massive trees um, growing right down within the Antarctic Circle at this time. And we've got relatives that are known as podocarps, uh, like the mountain plum pine in New South Wales or and also these Araucaria family and these are related to modern um, Norfolk Island pines or um, bunya bunya pines and so you can see this bunya bunya pine these would have been very tall very emergent and we've got lots of wood from these different kinds of conifers we don't have wood from the flowering plants because <clears throat> this was discovered uh, and recognized in um, the late 80s, early 90s as the oldest flower in the entire world from right here in Victoria, near a little town called Coonwara in Gippsland. And it was recognized from within these beautiful lake sediments. So there were lakes forming at this time. And since then, we've discovered a lot more uh, fossil leaves and beautiful tiny pollen uh, that we can, um, recognise 23 different species. So there's so much more diverse in this early part of the Cretaceous here in Australia. The other really amazing, fascinating um, uh, question and complex problem was how did they get here into uh, such high latitudes? Did they come down from Asia um, uh, where some of the even older fossils have now been found. The oldest flower now recognised from China um, from back into the Jurassic period. So we're pushing this knowledge back, but we're finding that in fact, the journey of these um, flowers into uh, Victoria must have occurred from um, across Antarctica and from South America. So it's really fascinating uh, looking at the provenance of and the evolution of these flowering plants to answer some of the questions such as Charles Darwin's abominable mystery. And here, uh, this um, recent paper by Sorke et al from the, he works at the um, Sydney Herbarium and they've discovered, um, put together information from the fossils and from the DNA of modern um, plants relatives to find what the earliest flowers would have looked like. So we can actually build up a picture of the understory, the midstory, and the and the tall trees that are forming these forests and put together the ecosystems from three different time slices within these uh, early Cretaceous. So those earliest forests are just like they were in the Jurassic around the rest of um, uh, the Gondwana area. We're finding large, beautiful um, podocarp relative, um, mountain plum pine relative. Um, uh, conifers, we're finding the understory of beautiful lush ferns and even liverworts showing how these fine leaf conifers and ferns were so rich in these uh, warm, lush, wet environments. But then we start to see uh, just when the first flowers are evolving, we're finding that the, the conifer trees are now dominated by scale leaf um, varieties. There's ginkgos, there's more of the seed ferns. And so actually at this time, we're finding within these lake areas that it's very cold, it's much more dark and disturbed environments. Um, these in the first flowers are actually on these very herbaceous little um, uh, tiny plants. So there's no wood from those flowering plants at this time. During the middle time slice, um, no, sorry, the latest time slice now, the third time slice here, you can see that it's starting to, uh, the rift valley is opening wider. We're getting really broad leaf conifers. Those ones like those bunya bunya, aracaria that we see growing 
in across Queensland, down in Tasmania, the hoop pines, or in New Zealand, the carry pines. And we're seeing all of these um, very rich, rich and lush kinds of warm environments again. And we're actually getting some conifers that indicate more coastal environments. And we discovered some of the very tiny uh, spores from marine algae so that this lets us know that we're getting uh, uh, the sea creeping in in a much earlier time than has previously been recognized so to summarize the flora let's think about we've seen the ginkgos and the seed ferns and lots of those um scale leaf conifers um from the jurassic carrying over into the earliest time of the early cretaceous then we're seeing um no evidence of ice caps or glaciers, but, but glaciers in Queensland help us to understand it did get cold for some time. That's when we're seeing the first flowers, but then into the warmer, latest part of the early Cretaceous, we're seeing 23 different species of flowering plants coming through South America and Antarctica. Um, they're, they're quite different to the species that are up in Queensland. Uh, so it's a different path. And we're seeing uh, uh, these broad leafed uh, very emergent, tall, and very uh, large woody uh, conifers dominating the tall story, the upper story. So what about the animals? What fossils have we got in the animals that can tell us about the uh, life near the poles in within that Antarctic circle? And if we think of what's down there today, there are penguins, there are a few seals, um, but really there's not much in the way of the plants. There's only three um, flowering plant species uh, down in Antarctica today. So we have fossils of a beautiful, rich um, ecosystem filled with uh, different kinds of insects. There's mayflies and damselflies, and look at this beautiful dragonflies and beetle um, wings that we have. We have little crickets and grasshoppers, cockroaches, of course, and thrips. And so our recent paper uh, has been, and the uh, work has been done by Dr. Sarah Martin from Western Australia. We've also got amazing rich um, uh, crayfish as well. And um, you can see these kinds of yabbies would have lived along the rivers. But interestingly, the reptiles tell us uh, how rich the uh, <clears throat> The fauna was back in this time. We can see um, from Dr. Parapat, we can see these really large teeth that would have belonged to plesiosaurs. So that and again, these ones were discovered in that latest part of the early Cretaceous. This is also evidence that pro probably the sea is starting to come in um, at this time. But we've also got rich, um, diverse turtles and crocodiles. Uh, inhabiting the rivers and amazing that we also have these giant salamanders so if you think of the size of an axolotl today it's not very big but back in the Cretaceous we had the last of these giant kinds of salamanders here's a beautiful um, drawing from Peter Trosler to show you how they would have inhabited the rivers <clears throat> of these large valleys um, these were quite diverse and abundant more in the older times through um, even in the Paleozoic as well as the Mesozoic, but um, they thought to have gone extinct. Um, and so we're lucky to have these kinds of relics here in Victoria remaining on. Um, what about the dinosaurs? Well, there were little herbivores and amazing to see that they were chicken sized. They were quite different to the kinds of dinosaurs found in Queensland. These are known as ornithopods or hip, bird hip um, kinds of dinosaurs. But interesting, these are not the ones that went on to evolve into the modern birds. And so this tiny variety has been called Leylinosaura and um, we get Quantasaura. And these are Hypsilophodontids. But when we study, when the um, Stephen Parapat, Pat Vickers Rich and Tom Rich have studied these kinds of uh, um, skulls. You can see that the orbital lobes, the eyes were huge. This um, means that they were able to uh, catch more light. And so they were able to live closer down in within the Antarctic circle where it would have been darker. Um, 
were they non-migratory a lot of their bone histology is also showing that potentially they had a kind of uh, same similar bones to modern birds and to modern warm-blooded creatures so uh, were they able to survive down at the south pole we have this new uh, very small dinosaur called diluvicursa pickeringi um, Again, there's a beautiful painting from Peter Trusler showing them uh, near these very, very broad rivers um, <clears throat> as it starts to form lakes. And we see this exceptionally uh, well described flora around um, showing these aracarias, the cycads, the ginkgos. So the cycads and, and ginkgos and a lot of seed ferns were actually pushed to extinction by the flowering plants as well. What about the predators? These are very exciting kinds of um, dinosaurs that we find. So initially for a very long time, there weren't many predators recognized. There weren't many large dinosaurs discovered down here in Victoria. And so um, uh, the earliest um, predators were found around the 80s, so these allosaurids. Um, but since then, there've been so many different kinds discovered. There's at least four, possibly up to nine different kinds of species. And um, not too long ago, we published about the Tyrannosaurids. Um, so this Timimus, and uh, you can see that these would have been uh, preying on those uh, smaller herbivores. And we did have a raptor as well, which is exciting. Um, what about the mammals? Well, most of the mammals were thought to have evolved at the, after the extinction of the dinosaurs into the modern Cenozoic era. Um, and it's fantastic that we've been able to discover, the riches have discovered these exceptionally uh, preserved uh, jaws of these mammals and they're extremely tiny they actually fit on the top of a, a, a thumbtack head to go under the microscope so we need high powered microscopes to have a look at these and we can see that they were tiny shrew like or rodent like um, a lot of them were very uh, so early in the evolution of mammals that they were um, at the base of the family tree of all the mammals um, that we see today. So they can, could not fit into either the monotremes and marsupials or the placental type mammals. We see the multi and basal monotremes also, which is not surprising given that um, that's where most of them exist today in Australia. Um, <clears throat> paper last year by the Richards has also described these exceptionally preserved feathers and these are also from the lakes over in Gippsland um, alongside the same age as the earliest flower there's um, feathers that <clears throat> indicate that they're from down possibly very very tiny so they might be from hatchlings even they're feathers that indicate that there were um, uh, belong to organisms or <laughs> mammals that sorry reptiles that could fly or potentially birds and so there's also um, uh, been studies done on the colour and it can be preserved in the, um, in the, within the molecules of these fossils that we can describe the, the colour. And so they were actually quite dark, black or brown and possibly um, banded. So they are most likely um, to, the dinosaur ones are most likely to belong to the Velociraptor-like, but there are certainly also evidence of, um, of bird ones. So we can put together the evidence. I've talked a lot about um, the, the rocks and the fossils today. We've covered quite a lot already, but we can put all that information together and build up a picture of what it would have been like if you were to um, wander along in this ancient time down within the Antarctic Circle, it would have looked very similar to uh, the South Island of New Zealand with these very, very broad um, river plains with the braided streams and channels winding across them. We would have had lots of um, <clears throat> intermittent kinds of um, sandbars and gravels and then off onto the floodplain, the flat lying areas, we would have seen lots of those rich um, uh, flowering plants and seed plants and ferns around billabongs, which would have expanded into lakes. And then we would have had all of those high level um, mountain ranges or very tall hills to the side of the rift 
And so we're seeing the large conifers dominating around that area. So the earliest, uh, I just noticed there's a QA. and a Thank you, Peter. What part of the early Cretaceous do you find the first angiosperms? And so that was in the middle time slice of the early Cretaceous. We're finding the oldest flower and we're also finding um, uh, spores and pollen, rather pollen from, from these um, flowering plants. But it's incredible to think that by the, just by um, 10 million years later or 15 million years later within the uh, latest part of the um, early Cretaceous, we're finding such diversity with, of these uh, flowering plants. And you can see here that the forests would have been dominated by these large conifers, lots of tree ferns and cycads and lush forests with um, lewis, um growing around and very thick along the, the uh, wide rift valleys. But the flowering plants would have just been very small herbaceous things. So this is um, drawing together on the information from the rocks and the information from the fossil plants, as well as uh, thinking about the, the rich insect and, and um, vertebrate life forms. We see that we can uh, build up a picture of the whole environment at this time, um, very similar to New Zealand with these large braided rivers, these little lakes and billabongs, uh, which were probably the uh, disturbed environments that were the flowering plants were able to take advantage here and, and eventually they forced out all of those seed plants, seed ferns. We're seeing different kinds of conifers out on the floodplains, the, the more sort of plum pines, whereas in the highlands we would have seen those emergent large um, aracaria, the cowrie or bunya bunya type pines. So this is all sitting within the Antarctic Circle here, we see um, it's been reconstructed for Victoria to be quite close, um, uh, or quite high latitude rather. So how are they all surviving? And some um, fascinating studies were done uh, through the 90s looking at how modern Bunya Bunya pines and Araucaria family can actually survive and remain dormant in these trees, uh, can remain dormant for up to six months. So there's certainly a lot of evidence from the wood here, uh, as well as wood uh, that's been studied uh, by people like <clears throat> Professor Dame Jane Francis, looking at uh, wood from Antarctica itself at this time. And it's shown that they did remain dormant, these trees, and were able to survive this very low angles of light and uh, uh, they were actually spaced quite wide apart as well. So what about the um, fauna though? How would they survive the winter darkness? Well, <clears throat> the large types of dinosaurs uh, would need to have to, um, migrated away, but there's certainly evidence with the large eye lobes, with the within the bones of these small chicken sized dinosaurs as to whether they did in fact uh, remain dormant through the winter time again from Peter Tresler, this exceptional painting showing, bringing to life the science and, um, and even studies that, re <laughs> that um, sorry, some studies that um, also float the idea that maybe there were burrows. So certainly the feathers from last year uh, that were described have also really added to this story to show that if they're very tiny downy feathers that they're really adding to the um, ability of these creatures to stay warm and um, and survive these very very cold areas although there was no glaciers here but certainly there were around at that time uh, and possibly very very close to the pole and then Finally, to finish off today, I'll just describe uh, a bit of the research that has been coming about um, in recent years about the evidence of what did happen to the dinosaurs. There were so many different kinds of theories. Was it climate change? Was it the volcanoes that erupted and, and ended up uh, causing them to go extinct? Were they going extinct already, even before the very end of the Cretaceous at 66 million years ago? So <clears throat> there's a lot of <laughs> different kinds of theories about the extinction of the dinosaurs. And it's, it's, it's been researched 
a lot and um and so there's been a lot of a fierce kind of debate about this in the scientific literature but certainly the science sedimentary evidence has been building up over um decades um if there was an impact then we would expect to see a lot of sedimentological evidence we would expect to see iridium from these um meteorites where iridium is, is very rich in the meteorite out of space rocks much richer than most of the earth rocks and so we do in fact see this layer um being preserved right around the world down in antarctica right around um europe as well we would expect to see um evidence of the Im impact into the um sedimentary rocks like the, the quartz and so you can actually find this shocked quartz it's um gets fractured uh around the, uh, at the time of the impact and it has been discovered around central and uh, north america and we'd also expect to see these uh, melted earth rocks um silica rich glassy structures known as tectites that are discovered around all different impacts around earth um so where's the evidence for that and incredibly in uh the last couple of uh, decades we've discovered a lot of research has been describing these tectites in america and central america this ejector blanket within belize um, uh, um amazing tsunami uh style deposits and fish bed fish kill beds in north america as well so the evidence is pointing to central america um perhaps rather than the the large volcanic provinces that were occurring more over in the india at the time and so the final smoking gun is uh the in the 1990s the um impact crater itself was just discovered off the yucatan peninsula in mexico so there's been recent um uh, seismic and international ocean discovery program um, research focused on this area having a look at the different layers and trying to find the evidence as well as the uh, gravity surveys and seismic surveys that show this very very large impact uh, that really was the uh, evidence to show that the dinosaurs um, became extinct as a result of a large impact and it would have caused um, a dark winter around the world. You can see evidence in New Zealand um, of the plants dying back, as well as a lot of the fauna going extinct. The plants themselves didn't suffer nearly as much in this um, extinction event. They certainly died back. Um, <clears throat> there's evidence that then the, the um, new colonizers like fungi, etc., were then. Um, uh, being preserved in the layers overlying this time period but certainly um, the flowering plants didn't suffer any kind of setback there so having a look at the end cretaceous mass extinction event that killed off the dinosaurs it was actually the fifth of all mass extinction events through that phanerozoic time period from 550 million years ago we're seeing large mass extinctions occurring much larger than um, the end Cretaceous one, and particularly at the end of the Permian. So 252 million years ago, we're seeing the biggest extinction of all time known as the Great Dying at the end Permian, beginning of the Triassic. And this time period, this extinction event, now so much evidence has been built up to show that this was a result of warming and of climate change, rapid climate change. We have another event at the moment also being described here at the um, in the Cenozoic. After the dinosaur extinction, we can see the end of the Permian, a very, very rapid warming event. And so these rapid warming events are correlating to mass extinctions. We also know as a result of um, the extinction of the large megafauna like mammoths and the and the uh, ones in Australia, giant kangaroos, giant um, wombats, giant um, thylacoleos, even bigger than the Tasmanian tiger. Of course, the Tasmanian tiger and all of the different species that are going extinct today that we are, could well be sitting here in six mass, ex mass extinction. So this is sobering to think of, but it's in our hands. 
we have seen the world change from a very lush, warm um, environment with no ice caps over the poles to what we see today where humans have evolved and thrived. And so this is what we um, could be at the threshold of altering this system and reversing these uh, glacial interglacial periods. So this is the kind of um, scenario that we want to avoid and when it's in our hands at the moment. Um, so thank you, Peter, again, another question. That was the Aptian. Um, so yes, the Aptian there. And um, thank you, Deborah, for another question. Given glaciers, what's now Queensland, much colder environment than Victoria? Uh, was it colder in Queensland? So it was probably just that there are, were high, higher altitude um, in Queensland because in Victoria, the rocks are being deposited um, from the um, down in the valley. And so we're not getting the, any glacial deposits um, being preserved here. Whereas in Queensland, um, sort of right into the outback um, parts of Queensland, there are some uh, glacial deposits. And so this was um, more a record of probably some highlands up there. Um, certainly down into the areas around Winton and down in the Cooper Basin, down the south where um, some of these large, huge sauropods are being discovered. These were also um, in the lowlands, though. So I hope that answers your questions um, in the Q&A. And um, I'd like to acknowledge my research group at the University of Melbourne, Associate Professor Stephen Gallagher, Dr Vera Karasidis and Dr Barbara Wagstaff, who are micropaleontologists looking at the spore of pollen, Professor Malcolm Wallace, Dr Ash Hood, who look at very ancient climates. And um, we have my collaborators, of course, <clears throat> from the museum and Swinburne, Stephen Porapat, Pat Lucas Rich and Tom Rich, looking at the vertebrates, uh, as well as the invertebrates from Sarah Martin, this uh, incredible scientist and artist, Peter Trezler, and um, my supervisors from um, School of Botany as well. So thank you very much for joining me today. And um, for the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we have lots of time um, for questions. If you'd like to head over to the Q&A section um, and put in your questions there, I'd be happy to um, answer your questions. And we also have a couple that have popped up in the chat. So I'll have a look at that now. Um, Uh, thank you, Judith Cook, for your um, comment about my talk. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learnt something from that. Um, there's a really interesting question from Spall. Sorry, I don't know your name, but what direction is the research going in now with the Cretaceous fossils in Victoria? Are there any wild theories um, being tested? Well, <laughs> that's a uh, very interesting question. So the research um, currently uh, is not being funded um, by the usual funding bodies of the um, Australian Research Council, um, but certainly the Riches and their colleagues um, at the museum in Swinburne are still very active in their research on the fauna. Um, and uh, they've worked with National Geographic, um, I know. Um, at Melbourne University, we have other projects that we're focusing on at the moment. And um, so a lot of the uh, microfossil sorts of projects that we're looking at um, to understand these um, uh, very, uh, very ancient kinds of environments, but also just looking at these um, uh, uh, discovery drill cores uh, to help understand the basin um, formations, etc. So it's a bit more geological on that sense. Um, uh, but my own um, work as well is also just uh, keeping burning in the background, I guess. So I'm not sure about the wild theories. Um, there's a lot of volunteer work still goes on uh, along the Gippsland and Otway coast of um, digs normally. Um, 
apart from the COVID years, of course, uh, but there's certainly amazing fossils still turning up and there's still so much that we can learn as well. So thank you very much for your question. And thank you, Ellie. Um, that's very nice uh, of you to say about my talk. Do you happen to know the fossils at Ricketts Point is her question. And so Ellie, these are um, much, much younger. They're all around about 6 million years old. I, I, assume you're talking about Ricketts Point down near Bo Morris. Um, so there's been some fantastic fossils turning up. Um, the museum, Dr. Eric Fitzgerald is actually working on the sharks and um, whales and dolphins from this region, from this time period. And he's discovered some amazing evolutionary stories about the um, cetaceans, the dolphins and whales. But um, yes, yeah, certainly some very large teeth um, discovered and bones from down there. Um, and thank you, Max, very much for attending. Um, and there's also, uh, Ellie, just to finish on the Ricketts Point, there's some beautiful other kinds of shells from the ocean, sea urchins, et cetera, from down there. So about 6 million years old. Um, there's another question from Simona. Thank you. Um, the presence of flowering plants suggests the presence of primitive fruits, um, that's correct. And so we do have some really interesting kinds of seeds that we haven't been able to uh, find out exactly where they're coming from. Um, some of them are quite big, some of them are uh, so probably more along the conifer lines, but, but certainly there are some smaller ones. And so we've never really been able to find out um, exactly where they belong, but that's certainly uh, work that would be really interesting to continue in the future. So we have a couple of other questions uh, from the Q&A section as well, I'll return to. Thank you, John. What other fossils have been found in Coonwarra? And have the recent massive roadworks at the site uncovered any additional fossils there? Thank you, John F. Um, there have been some recent massive roadworks. There have been some new um, fossil digs down there as well. Um, that we're certainly still working on them. And I know the museum particularly have been working on uh, that material. So, um, uh, so far, I guess uh, a lot of the, the feathers have been um, published just last year. So there's a lot of work uh, that is continuing on this kind of material. The feathers and the old, one of the oldest flowering plants in the world coming from that Coonwara site originally. Also some of the very interesting uh, fossil wood and, and seeds from some of those diverse seed ferns um, such as Sarnia uh, were described from this area. So there's a lot of really fascinating interesting things but it would be great to be able to go down and, and discover more and find out if there were uh, what kinds of birds um, and uh, much more about the diversity at this time. Thank you, Audrey. Um, Audrey's wondering exactly how you determine the fossil ginkgo was indeed a ginkgo and the difference between um, that and the living one was, was quite marked. So um, we do have um, seeds and we do have the pollen. And so this is really um, also shown that if you take a modern ginkgo with only the two lobes on the leaf and you stress the plant, it will actually grow um, a leaf in a palmate shape like that with lots of divisions in its leaf. So it's really remarkable that the modern ginkgo can actually still do that. So yes, we have drawn the links between these as well um, over through fossils in the meantime. But um, in saying that the seed ferns and the ginkgo that were around in the early Cretaceous were thought to go extinct at the end of the early Cretaceous because of all those flowering plants. And incredibly, new, more fossils were found in Tasmania from the Cenozoic, from much, much younger time, and uh, Tasmania and, and New South Wales. So um, uh, Dr. Stephen McLaughlin, who now works in Sweden, described these fossils. And it was as if a dinosaur was turning up after that, um, after the Cretaceous to find these seed ferns still growing uh, um, in a much, much younger time period. It was quite remarkable. Thank you very much, GJR, for your kind words. Thank you, Deborah. Is there a theory? Um, sorry, it's just jumped around. 
Is there a theory on what caused the higher temperatures around the Permian mass extinction? There certainly is, Deborah. There's a lot of theories, but certainly one of the ones that is coming out um, as with lots of evidence behind it is um, anoxia. And so in the deep oceans, there's showing to be uh, lots of anoxia. And, um, and so this is showing um, the rapid climate change has actually affected the deep ocean, causing um, a lot of drown drawdown of the um, oxygen and um, and so this would have uh, killed off a lot of the organisms particularly in the ocean and certainly there's a lot of work going on right now in, by Dr Stephen McLaughlin in um, around the Sydney area looking at this time period and and working out what was going on on the land at the same time because this is all of the land plants and the biggest mass extinction of all time 95 percent of all species going extinct so that is one of the major um, theories behind it. Uh, what were the temperatures during these times? Thank you, Sharon, for your question. During the early Cretaceous, the mean annual temperatures were much higher than they were today around that, that same latitude. And so um, they were thought to be uh, much, much warmer with the um, carbon dioxide at least twice what it is today. So we hit over 400 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It was over 800 um, parts per million at that time. And so the mean annual temperatures were certainly much greater, um, probably more like um, what we see around um, uh, Victoria today, in fact, um, or possibly even up further north. So somewhere around uh, 15 to 20, uh, degrees mean annual temperature. So thank you, Caroline. Uh, would it be broadly true to say that the Southern Australian flora is linked to evolution in Gondwana and Northern Australia flora more influenced from spread of plants from Northern tropical zones? So that is true um, to an extent, Caroline, this is what we've been working on trying to discover. And certainly um, this um, early times of the angiosperm cells flowering plants in Victoria, is much more influenced from South America and, and um, Antarctica. Uh, and Queensland was in quite influenced more from Asia at that time. But of course, the modern flora is quite different. It's more mixed. It has certainly merged and it does have a lot of influence still from Asia, but there are some relics uh, up in Queensland uh, within that uh, from the Gondwanan times. Uh, so in the late Cretaceous, we see um, the southern beach and the proteaceae family, the banksia type family, um, evolving and, and forming the trees in that late half of the Cretaceous. Um, and so they were forming forests around Antarctica and southern Australia, and, and they still exist um, up in the tropics today. Nicole, thank you. Um, Joanna, welcome. Um, great to hear from you, and thank you for your question. What about Antarctica? Um, Antarctopelta, the great, kept warm enough without feathers or armour on its underside. So the, um, it's a fantastic question. It is still ongoing research. Most of the dinosaurs probably would have migrated away from those very, very cold regions and moved away during the, the very darkest, coldest times. Um, but um, we still see um, even the amphibian, the, the salamander being able to survive uh, in the warm times at this very high latitude. So it was just a much, much warmer world. Interestingly, also it was much warmer at the polar um, latitudes than, uh, than compared to the, um, sorry, the, <laughs> The difference between the poles and the equator was, was much less in the Cretaceous that's been shown than it is today. It's a much greater difference between the equator and the poles. So yes, it was much, much warmer at that time. So they were able to survive even with scales. Um, and that, and Adaji, thank you for your question. During what time period was Australian fauna most diverse? That is a very difficult question to answer because um, the diversity has been explored throughout the entire Phanerozoic and in the oceans originally there was a lot of um, uh, diversity within the Cambrian explosion it's called where there was a, um, a diversification like massive uh, radiation evolution event 
Um, so there was a lot of diversity then. There was certainly a lot of diversity during the Permian uh, time periods as well before that massive major extinction. It was starting to become quite diverse in the Cretaceous, probably not as Cretaceous, uh, not as diverse. Um, and probably we're seeing a lot greater diversity through into the Cenozoic, later part of the Cenozoic. Um, but this is where we've started to see decline through recent times in the last 10,000 years. Um, and so this is the worry of the sixth mass extinction. How rapid were the transitions in polar temperatures seen in polar Australia? Well, that's a great, thank you, TJR. I think it was a great question. Uh, it's quite difficult to say the rapid transitions um, were probably uh, millions of years there. Um, and we can compare that to, I'll go back a slide, to here. During the Permian, this was a much more rapid, thought to be maybe less than a million years. And this one uh, at the end of the Permian was within five to 10,000 years. This is probably one of the um, most rapid, recent and dramatic warmings events at the end of the Paleocene. So um, that uh, is a really good analog for um, understanding the modern warming as well. But we can see that um, modern warming is, is occurring over hundreds, not thousands of years. Um, thank you to the next uh, question. I was curious how you would do histology on fossilized bones to determine the organism that's warm blooded. That's a great question. So it wasn't me personally. This is the Tom and Pat Rich, um, uh, Pat Vickers Rich have worked with um, a histology specialist. And um, so I can point you to the um, paper for that. Um, so if you please would email me, I'd be very happy to do that. So she was looking at bone thin sections, just as you would do with a modern uh, mammal uh, versus a reptile and to understand the different um, uh, morphologies within uh, the different bones. So that's um, something that's super specialized, um, but there are people who work on modern uh, bones that understand the different uh, comparisons um, between things like birds versus reptiles or mammals versus reptiles. So um, there's certainly characteristics that are in the morphology that help us to identify the warm blooded from the cold blooded. And so apparently some of these characters were discovered within these fossil bones. So yeah, there are some fantastic research papers out there. How do you spell Coonmora? Thank you um, uh, to uh, the next question from Sh Sharon. I will type the answer to that one. Um, yeah, it's with a K. <clears throat> so it's a, um, a small town in Gippsland and it's um, very famous for its um, uh, fossils. But as I mentioned, they were um, from the road digs. And so they have been on um, public land from um, road digs. And so they're not very accessible to the public. And of course, all of the safety, um, occupational health and safety protocols were followed during that. So it's uh, probably not something that you can just access very easily. Um, more easily to uh, look for fossils would be to join one of the museum digs or to um, have a look along the coastal areas as long as you're staying away from cliffs. Um, so Gayatri, thank you for your question. As you said, very few species survive mass extinction. Um, the flowering plants uh, certainly survived the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction. And how did the others survive? So the mammals must have survived and the birds, interestingly. So they evolved from the theropods. The theropods were those huge uh, predatory dinosaurs and they're the ones that evolved into the birds and certainly they survived um, the end Cretaceous mass extinction. So how would they have survived? It was probably because the mammals and those birds were actually quite small. And so they were able to uh, forage around and, um, and uh, <clears throat> certainly wouldn't have been very close to that impact, but certainly away from the impact in areas like Asia and uh, Europe um, and certainly the southern parts of the world, they would have been able to survive. 
Um, when does the Wollamai pine date from? So thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> there are <clears throat> some amazing papers on the Wollamai pine as well. So they are Jurassic to Cretaceous sage fossils as well. Um, so uh, up to 200 million years um, old, those ones. So uh, I'll, it's a uh, Wollamai pine. Um, trying to get my arrow back, it's disappeared and send that to you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, finally, <clears throat> what evidence has there been for monotreme diversity and when did this occur? Was this evidence through Gondwana? It is fascinating to have a look that these little um, uh, platypus and echidna relatives were evolving at this time in the early Cretaceous. So these are the oldest ones discovered in the world. And even though the monotremes and marsupials or well, the marsupials um, also occur in, in South America and there are fossils in Antarctica, but these are the oldest ones. Um, so uh, to, to my knowledge, um, so certainly some of the earliest and, and they're, they're evolving right here in this Rift Valley. Um, so they're just beautiful, very precious and unique fossils. Um, and this was, uh, I understand that there certainly are some from South America and Antarctica, um, but um, actually I'm not entirely sure about which are older, but it was my understanding uh, or my memory that uh, these were some of the oldest anyway. And there are a lot of Cretaceous um, yeah, marsupials uh, within South America and Antarctica, I know that. Um, we have a webinar about monotremes if you're interested. So that's been posted in the chat window. Uh, so please do have a look at that and, and join that. And amazing that um, some researchers at the University of Melbourne uh, have managed to crack the code of the Tasmanian tiger um, uh, DNA. So speaking of marsupials, but yes, this is a monotreme one looking at the platypus and echidna. <clears throat> And that brings us to the end of all of the uh, questions. And I apologise if I've missed anyone. I hope I answered your question and particularly Jaina, I really hope I answered your question, but I did have an extra slide here that you might be interested in having a look at. Um, at the end, I was hoping somebody might ask about the Queensland um, ones. And so the uh, comparison, as I was saying, most of our uh, herbivores are quite small chicken sized kind of um, creatures but up in Queensland they have these giant sauropods um, and so uh, they also have these flying reptiles uh, that have just been described um, from Queensland there so they're really interesting beautiful um, kinds of uh, creatures if you go back oh. If you ever get a chance to go to Queensland, the um, Age of Dinosaurs uh, Museum is fantastic as well. And thank you, Sharon. Absolutely, Steve has done some great work. So that's Stephen Poropat. Um, and so he's one of my collaborators, absolutely. And so this is all based on um, the uh, revision paper we looked, did from, from last year. Thank you very much, Sharon. And thank you very much, Miles. Thank you very much, Ellie. I appreciate you all attending. And uh, uh, thank you, Sharon, for your other comments. And um, <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, the revision paper and the feather paper. Uh, so, Parapat, um, it's early, so it's just polar. Um, I, have to, I might have to look that up. I'm sorry, I've just come to the, to a blank. Um, <laughs> uh, as for the pet feather paper as well. Um, so I'll put in my email if you could please send me up. Thank you. I will I will save that chat. Thank you, Sharon. I'll certainly send you those papers.
And so thank you all very much for your attendance today and for joining our University of Melbourne Science Week. We hope to see you at other events.